from the Clark Ford Studio in Oxford, Mississippi, MBW Digital proudly presents the Oxford Exxon Podcast. I'd say thanks for tuning in, but why am I going to give you a round of applause for something you're supposed to do, to be frank? And now, here are your hosts, Chase Parm. And broadcast school has really paid off. And Neil McCrady. I deserve to be on TV. This Monday edition of the Oxford Exxon Podcast, Chase Farm, Neil McCready, Clark Ford Studio here today. The uh, baseball postseason, or at least the SEC tournament here as Ole Miss heads to uh, Hoover today. It's the practice at the Hoover Met. I think it's, it's the Hoover Met again. It was like Regions Park for a little while, but once they did the stadium downtown, it's flipped back to the Hoover Met uh, this afternoon. And they will play the Vanderbilt Commodores tomorrow around 4.30 if the weather will cooperate, but it looks Horrid the first in the next few days in uh, Hoover this week, so expect some delays. It's kind of a annual tradition there for the SEC uh, tournament. So we'll talk about that today, the weekend, what it means for Ole Miss heading into the week, and uh, plenty of other topics. For us. We're all pretty busy right now, so we'll get to that and more here coming up on the podcast. Podcast brought to you every single day by the Oxford Exxon Highway Six West in Oxford. Remember, still got a few more days of barbecue month at all Blue Sky locations in Mississippi. Slab of ribs, full slab, sixteen ninety nine. You can make it a family meal, add some sides and everything else for nineteen ninety nine. Drumsticks as cheap as seventy nine cents, leg quarters and more. There again at the Oxford Exxon and all Blue Sky locations in Mississippi and coming to you from the Clark Ford Studio. We are Clark Ford's in Amory, Mississippi. Six six two two five seven nineteen hundred is the number. Call it. Ask for Corey Clark. Tell Corey what Ford product you're looking for. He'll send you a quote within fifteen minutes in business hours. Right to the bottom line. No hassle. No haggle. You get your quote. The rest is completely up to you. You can shop that quote around. You can do what I've done, what I recommend that you do. Let's hop into a Clark Ford today. 662-257-1900. Guest will join on the Rafters Music and Food Hotline. Rafters Music and Food on the Square in Oxford. Great place to grab a burger, a po' boy, appetizers, uh, great beer selection, full bar, and more. there at Rafters on the Square in Oxford and also Rafters in New Albany. So Ole Miss falling uh, two out of three to Texas A&M over the weekend, losing the middle game, and um, you know, being overly competitive, frankly, in the other two in some different ways as they uh, finished the season 32-21, and 21, I believe. They were three games short of the normal schedule. They had a couple of rainouts in that game against Arkansas State to save RPI purposes. Their RPI this morning, I had it up a minute ago, it is somewhere around 38, 39, 36. It is 36 as of right now. So Ole Miss heading to Hoover, clearly on the bubble for for sure. Um, that's the, the the least of it. They at least get in the conversation. They win, I guess, seven of their last nine to uh, to jump back into a in, into a talk about whether they can get into the postseason. They're going to start Dylan Delucia against uh, against Vanderbilt tomorrow. Vanderbilt had held out uh, Carter Holton from the weekend after he threw a complete game shutout against Arkansas two weeks ago to uh, to rest him. He didn't feel very good. He didn't throw against LSU. I haven't seen this, but my guess would be he would throw against Delucia tomorrow for the Commodores, but it's it's merely a guess at this point. I have no idea. Um, so 4.30 for, uh, for that one. And uh, we'll get into kind of go back a little bit, go forward, but you, I see you've got the, the headline there. Do they have to win? I, it is pretty much a coin flip. Went through, looked at some stats, and SEC teams who have 14 wins at the end of – the SEC tournament. That has happened 13 times since 2003, and six of those teams have made the NCAA tournament. So just under 50% there at that point. If you win a 15th game, it is, uh, it's 11 out of 16 have made the tournament. However, it's 11 out of 11 if your RPI is better than 50. All five teams who have not done it with that 15th win has, uh, has made the NCAA tournament as long as their RPI was in any manageable level. Ole Miss's RPI, no matter what, will be in the 40s. At worst, it will not fall past that. So, so it's your gut feeling that tomorrow is do or die. And then after that, no, none of it matters. My gut is they have to win. Now, could they sneak in as a three without winning? Sure. But at that point, it's not even about Ole Miss's resume. It is about how many bids are stolen around the country and how many at-large spots are remaining you know, we talk about that more with the the NCAA basketball tournament. You know, you can steal bids. You can do all these different things. Frankly, because most of the time, the better teams that are in, especially in power conferences, are winning their leagues. Um, so, it, it could go either way. You should watch the – if they lose tomorrow, still watch the selection show next Monday. But – some early indications I had gotten, some different things, was that Ole Miss really needs to win a baseball game tomorrow. Yes, that is my uh, that, that that is my educated guess. People continue to say 
Yeah, but the Governor's Cup counts, and it it, it does. But 15 and 16 is not the same as 15 and 15. Um, it counts. It's, it's an SEC. When, when the incident, what, 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 I, what I mean when I say it counts, because I do think this is important, because I think I'm confusing people when I think people are, are thinking that it's just an extra win, like, you know, like if you had you won one more league game. And their team sheet, when the committee gets it, is going to say Ole Miss is 15 and 16 in SEC games. That is the way that it counts. However, everybody knows that 15th win is the Governor's Cup against Mississippi State, not that they went 15 and 15 in league play. So when I'm comparing them, I have no way to compare that extra SEC wins to other teams because, frankly, Alabama and Auburn are the only two other teams that get that opportunity. So you can't take a team that gets 31 league games and, frankly, that fourth day, fourth game against a team that finished with about the 100th RPI and go, well, that's the same as this. So it, it counts, but it doesn't work into the metrics that we're trying to explain right now. So I'm just removing it for the sake of the metrics um, is kind of the point. But, look, Ole Miss has helped itself a ton. It got helped a ton by LSU sweeping Vanderbilt over the weekend. That really boosted some of their 25-50 numbers with LSU beating up the Commodores over the weekend. Um, their, their resume's okay. Their resume's not bad. It's, it's, it's okay. That Alabama series is just popping them in the teeth over and over and over and over again. If they don't get in, it will be that and non-conference scheduling for why they didn't get in. Um, but the top 50 numbers are better. The top 25 numbers are better. I think they have a really good case, and frankly, they'll have a better resume than some of the teams that don't get in if they don't get in. But for an SEC team, the standard has been completely set. I was talking to somebody pretty high up in college baseball yesterday who said, look, the baseball selection committee, more than any other sport, they follow routine. You know what they're going to factor in. You know what their expectations are for every conference, and that's just the way it is. And there is a certain minimum that has to be met, and Ole Miss is just above the baseline of that minimum, but it could go completely either way. If they win tomorrow, if they beat Vanderbilt, they are in. It is over. There is nothing else to consider from that point, and they cannot get into a host situation. So Hoover becomes utterly meaningless following a win tomorrow. But tomorrow's game very well could be a must-win for Ole Miss to make the NCAA tournament. Yeah. That's what I think. I mean, again, they could sneak in. So if they get in next Monday, they'll go, hey, you said no, – I, I mean, it's right there. It's, I mean, it's one way or the other. But you're trying to make sure ECU wins the American, and you're trying to make sure of this. And, I mean, it's – If they beat Vanderbilt, they're going to play Tennessee. You have RPIs in front of you. Vanderbilt's RPIs yeah. in the teens, I think. Yeah, somebody says they need to win two. No, they don't. They need to win no, one. Just one. They do not need to win two nope. games. No, nope. One is completely enough. I get people hate when people say this, but if they win – Tuesday, the rest of the tournament, from an Ole Miss perspective, is utterly and completely meaningless, other than the pursuit of a trophy. I mean, it, it just... You're it, not going to host. Yeah, Vanderbilt's RPI is five. So you play five, Tennessee's one? Tennessee's one. And then who are the other teams on their side that they could play? It's Kentucky, Auburn. Is it? I don't even know. I don't I know. I had it in front of me. But, I mean, look, yeah. I mean, RPI games in general. The teams in the SEC... Look, there's tons of RPI chances here. Just in general, in the SEC tournament, Tennessee 1, Georgia 12, Florida 24, Vanderbilt 5, Carolina 67, Kentucky 54, A&M 22, Arkansas 33. Arkansas is in deep shit from a hosting standpoint. That's what I wrote. I don't know if you read in 10 yeah. Thoughts. It was one of my like two hot takes. I don't think Arkansas – Even at 18 and 12, they might need two wins in Hoover to host. To, I don't think they're hosting. No matter what. I don't. I mean, 33, my God. I Why think, is it so bad? Because their schedule wasn't particularly good. Yeah, jeez. I don't. I don't think they host. I think they're. I think they're actually a team that that Hoover is meaningless. Uh, Arkansas thirty three, LSU twenty three, Auburn seven. They're in line for national seed. I, if I'm Auburn, I don't want to lose lose on Tuesday. No, I think Tuesday matters for Auburn. I think the tournament as a whole means a little bit to Auburn. They need to yeah. have a decent showing. Um, Ole Miss thirty six, Alabama forty eight, and then State finishes its season at one hundred four. Um, the worst RPI in the league by a long shot. Missouri ended up finishing fifty six. Actually, if I'm Ole Miss, another thing I'm watching is I'm watching if I lose Tuesday, I want Alabama to lose too. I want them to get out. So you're not dealing. So with they're them? not stealing your spot. They'd have to get hot. Yeah, they'd have to get hot, but like really hot. They'd have to win three probably. Yeah, let me look at them again. They've closed with a little bit of They're a 12 flourish. and 17. Yeah, RPI at 48. If they won three. It would take three. Yeah, it takes three. That'd get them to 15 They played wins. Georgia, which is very winnable. 
and they play either Arkansas or A&M, I was pulling the schedule up. Yeah. I mean. But most of the teams, the, the tournament's pretty meaningless in terms of ramifications. I know everybody wants to win a trophy. I get it. I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the, the ramifications of what happens to you if you do this or if you do that. There aren't too many teams. Yeah, Ole Miss's bracket is Vanderbilt, Ole Miss, Tennessee, Auburn, Kentucky, LSU. Yeah. So RPI gifts everywhere except for Kentucky. And even theirs is not so bad on a neutral site. Where it's, it's not hurting hurt you. Yeah. yeah. No, everything else helps you. I mean, Ole Miss, frankly – their RPI stays where it is or even bumps up a spot with a loss to Vanderbilt tomorrow. But that's not the important thing. Um, they just need to win, however they can get it to this point. Um, I told you yesterday what I would do if I were them tomorrow. I would go with I would go with Delucia, but the moment he looked tired or in trouble, I'd hand the ball to Brandon Johnson and say, how far can you take me? And if that meant that he were not available the rest of the week, I'm cool with that. Yeah. If I'm Mike Bianco. You're Delusia to Johnson and then figure it out. If I'm Mike Bianco tomorrow, I am managing one game. I'm not managing a tournament. I'm managing one game. And then I don't care what happens after that. If I get beat on Wednesday and Thursday and we head home on Thursday, I'm cool with it. We did our job. Yeah. We're a two somewhere. We'll go get ready for it. I, I go ahead and I use him. I don't try to find a non-existent bridge. I go straight to him, and if he can only get me through seven, I figure it out from there, and I hope that maybe I've built a lead by then. But I go with Delusia until he's flat, mm -hmm. and then I go straight to my closer. And I give myself a chance, and I hope that the guys on the other side, this Corbin doesn't have a lot to play for here. I think they're in either way. Even at 14 and 17, it's not pretty, but with that RPI of five. They're in. I mean, they're in. They're in. Um, but they're not hosting. There's nothing they can do to host. Probably not. So they're, 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 they're the inverse of Arkansas, though. If you told me Vanderbilt Randall Saturday. Maybe. You're 18 and, four, 18 and 16. My guess is that the committee already knows where Vanderbilt's going as a two. And it's already on the board. Yeah. Louisville or Oklahoma City, come on down. Or, yeah. or Stillwater, come on yeah. down. Yeah, they, they know where they're going. So that that would be my hope, if I'm Mike. But they, he's not going to – he, on the other hand, is not going to hand the ball to his closer and go give me five. He, I mean, he's just not. You have something to play for, go win that game. And then on Wednesday – well, because if look at the holding kid's not at 100% healthy, why in the hell would you throw him Tuesday? I mean, if no, he's got any issue well, you from, from LSU. You wouldn't. And to Corbin's credit, he's over his career. It's one of the reasons he recruits as well as he has is I think he's – his reputation is that he is – he errs on the cautious side. Oh, he skipped out on media Saturday. Get just off. Yeah. I know. It's not that important. It didn't change anything for you. Frankly, that one win didn't really do much either way. They got their head beat in all week. Gave up on a, what, an 11 run eight or something like that? Something like that. Yeah, kudos to LSU. They bounced back in a big way. They are either the last host or the first host out going into Hoover. Frankly, they probably need to yeah. win a game. They, they have, need to go 0-2. They have something to play for. They do. Yeah, I think they I think they absolutely need to uh need to win that game. Uh Looking at here, just finishing for anybody who's curious. Uh, Tennessee finished twenty-five and five in the SEC, so they do not break the record. The record was twenty-six and three, but good season there for the Vols, obviously. Uh, Georgia, uh, fifteen and fifteen. <laughs> My God, the rest of the East, which everybody had to play Tennessee. The rest of the league. Yeah, well, good point. Georgia fifteen and fifteen. Florida fifteen and fifteen. Vanderbilt fourteen and sixteen. South Carolina thirteen and seventeen. Kentucky twelve and eighteen. And Missouri ten and twenty. A&M 19 and 11, one win, one game over Arkansas at 18 and 12, LSU 17 and 13, Auburn 16 and 13, Ole Miss 14 and 16, Bama 12 and 17, and State at 9 and 21 to close the SEC season. Yeah, it's even the teams with really gaudy records. The RPIs are weird. I mean, it's it's been a strange year, frankly, in college baseball. But we have a microscope on the SEC, so it's been a it's been a strange year in the SEC. I mean, I was talking to 
told Neil this yesterday when we were just having a quick phone conversation. We were kind of having a press box talk about, you know, who is the second team that you would predict to be in Omaha if another one gets there. And everybody is so flawed, it's hard to come up with a significant number two that you love to get to the College World Series out of the league. I don't have one. Now, again, the whole country is like this. So right. some eight teams have to go. Somebody's yeah. going to get hot and do something. I'm just saying. But I, there's no big favorite. We go, oh, yeah, absolutely. I love how they set up. I've, I've watched a lot this year. Tennessee is obviously, far and away, the best team in the league. And then after that, it's just, I, I refer to it as kind of a mushy middle class. There's a bunch of teams in that. There's not a, there's not a lot of difference between LSU and Florida, for example. There's just kind of there. I mean, I probably like frankly, Florida a like, little better, but... Frankly, I like a lot of the teams below A&M and Arkansas more than I like A&M and Arkansas. I don't think A&M has enough pitching to make a postseason run. I just don't think Arkansas is very good. I've said that for weeks. Then I look at Auburn and go, how? Like, the, the line... The Butcher's done a hell of a job. They have some like, top line guys. Yeah. Like they have Gonzalez is a really good pitcher. Yeah. They have the the Lisa Sherris hit the hell out of the baseball. Yeah, he's year. player of the year. Yeah. He's a threat every time up. So his his presence in the lineup impacts the rest of the lineup a little bit. People don't want to pitch to him. And that lets other guys have opportunities and they've taken advantage of it. And they're pretty solid defensively. They're good. I mean, Auburn's good. But I don't think they're Omaha good. Frankly, LSU's the team that might, just because of their sheer offensive prowess, maybe. If you told me a second team got there, I think I'd say it's LSU. Yeah. But you're counting on Hilliard to win a game. And oh, yeah. Well, the, the, well the, pitching's, and... the pitching's not good. I mean, just would just be sheer offense. They can hit. But they can do it offensively. You saw that this weekend. So probably wouldn't be Vanderbilt. They just can't do it for whatever reason. Um, we talked about this with Ole Miss. If you told me it was Ole Miss, I'd go, huh? But I wouldn't be shocked. Ole Miss's deal, though, is this: it, it, it's got to be so clean. Picture a a path down a mountain. Yeah, there are no guardrails. Yeah, and it's really, really, really narrow. It's steep and curvy, and it's one and one if, lane. And if you take your eye off for just a second, it's over. You're off the cliff. Yeah, and and Ole Miss's path is win on a Friday, and on a Saturday with LA, and, and without burning too much of your bullpen. And then on Sunday, you out hit somebody, yeah. and you avoid Monday at all cost, because I don't think they have enough. The odd part of that is that their path to Monday making any sense would be that since McDaniel would have to start that game, it would keep Mike from using him in a bad situation out of the bullpen. Yeah. Because I know I've got to ask here, there's been a lot of gnashing of teeth over the weekend. Why has it Diamond improved? Why hasn't McDaniel improved? I still think Derek's hurt to some extent, frankly. I'm not putting that on development. Derek was really damn good in early 2020 prior to whatever happened. Um, I mean, he, he – that his start against Texas is like this outlier that just sticks out, and you go, "Wow, that one time, that one, that one week, that was crazy." Um, with McDaniel, he just hasn't been able to get over things mentally. Ole Miss thought that he kind of had. He had the really good week against Southern Miss. He had the good week against Mississippi State. He's absolutely a starter, not a reliever. He does not do well with coming in with guys on base. I mean, that was that was Mike's fault on Saturday because stubborn. You, you were not even using him in the right situation. It's stubborn. Um, and then allowing him to sit there when you know that is the deal with Drew. I mean, again, that's not on Drew. I mean, it, it you, you, it's. I don't know if I goes, hey, it's an excuse. No, it's an excuse. He he's a he's a decent starting pitcher. He is not a relief pitcher. Should he be better? Is the stuff better? Yes, but mentally, he's not been able to consistently do it. Right, wrong, and different. I don't know why. I don't know if that's a psychologist thing. I don't know if it's a pitching coach thing. I don't know if it's a head coach thing. I I I, I don't know, but. You have you have a lane to use Drew McDaniel where I think he can be very effective, and that was not it on Saturday. So those are two different guys. Diamond and McDaniel are not really the same case to me um, either way. But 
I'll even go one further. Yeah, sure. If I won on Tuesday, mm-hmm. I'd start McDaniel on Wednesday. Oh, I would too. Yeah. I'd save Elliot for Thursday. Let him have an extra day. Just keep a freshman who's thrown a lot closer yeah. to schedule. Hell, I might even hold him till Friday, and if I don't get there, I don't get there. He can go a little pin in Oxford and be fine. Yeah. Throw a sim game. Yeah. But I absolutely throw McDaniel on Wednesday and go, hey, dude, if we get beat, we get beat. Yeah. They're number one in the country. Screw it. Try to throw some fly balls and we'll see what happens. Don't worry about it. Yeah. The ball jumps out of Hoover more now than it did five, six, seven years ago, which the ball is livelier. I was talking to Kendall about that kind of over tax the other day. It's, there was some balls hit out over the weekend in Oxford, and I get the wind was blowing out to left, but they were not well struck, and they just carries and carries and carries and carries and carries. So, All right, we'll talk a little more baseball here in a second. First, about community mortgage, Oxford, Memphis, Soto County, and Chattanooga. All underwriting and processing is done in Memphis, so you can look underwriting and understand your market, leader in condo financing, the float down option, and more. You can find Jason at 662-234-2704 or J-L-O-W-E at communitymtg.com. We're brought to you by Holcomb Portable Buildings, 7991 Highway 7 South in Holcomb, Mississippi. They custom build your building to your specifications. However want, however you want your carport, storage shed, barn, hunting cabin, she shed, doghouse, or other building, Holcomb Portable Buildings can accommodate you. You pick the color, the style, the windows, and the doors, and Holcomb makes it happen. In-house financing is available, and there's free delivery and setup within 75 miles of Holcomb. For more information, call 662 662- 226-2233 or go to holcombuildings.com. You can also find them on Facebook or Instagram at Holcomb Portable Buildings. Hey, uh, Rebel Grove, did you know that Dead Soxy makes custom socks? Look, whether you're rallying your team or building an empire where you put your logo matters and you can't afford to put it on half-rate swag, Dead Soxy will help you create premium custom socks that you can stake your reputation on. Uh, Cool custom socks will make a lasting impression on clients, investors, employees, and donors. You don't have to have design skills. They do it all. Design's always free. They'll create digital mock-ups of designs, present them to you before your orders are placed. It's the same premium retail quality sock they're known for, but these are designed for you with your logo. The minimum order is 120 pairs of the same style. Lead time is six to eight weeks. So get your project started now. Go to deadsoxy.com backslash custom to check out what they do with custom socks. Mention you heard the ad on the MPW Digital Podcast. We're at Rebel Grove. You'll get $100 off all custom orders now. Deadsoxy.com backslash custom. My 10 weekend thoughts are up at uh, rebelgrove.com. They're brought to you by Game Changer Patches, the only two-patch system available in the market to stop hangovers before they start. The uh, warm-up patch is used before or while you drink. The overtime patch is used after you've been drinking to recover while you sleep. The all-natural ingredients will keep you in the game, ready for the next place. Go to GameChangerPatch.com, promo code REBELGROVE20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase. Also brought to you by ACS, Automation and Control Systems, LLC. It's a complete electrical control system solution provider and a Rockwell-recognized system integrator based in Baldwin, Mississippi. They've got a full-time dedicated emergency service and troubleshooting staff and a UL508A panel shot. They can custom tailor software packages, custom design electrical control panel solutions, and much, much more. To learn more, go to ACSLLCMS.com or call 662-601-4381. Also brought to you by Lamons Fine Jewelry at 1126 North Lamar Boulevard in Oxford. They've been serving the Oxford area for more than 75 years. Engagement rings, wedding rings, fine jewelry, watches, pearls, fashion jewelry, children's jewelry, collectibles, and more. Lamons is the gold standard in fine jewelry. Visit them at LamonsFineJewelry.com or call them at 662-234-2777. Podcast is brought to you by Johnson Hill Creamery, JohnsonHillCreamery.com. That's 662-419-9201 or email cheese at JohnsonHillCreamery.com. Go to their Instagram page. Tons of different things. They give you pictures of all their items. Their new items, their new cheeses, new creations, everything they have going there online at Johnston Hill Creamery. Remember, they have a new lunch menu out. You can get that uh, delivered via fetched delivery here uh, here in Oxford. So uh, see that as well. And again, a small batch of artisanal cheese made locally in-house every day just off Molly Bar on White Oak Lane, 662-419-9201. It's the way it is every year, and I'll give them credit for moving the game times back to 930. But there is just no 
buffer built in. These games have to go three hours to stay on time, and there is no chance in hell SEC baseball games are going three hours. It's Texas A&M in the tournament. They are in the tournament. Good God. Um, I got I got stopwatch happy on Friday or Saturday and started timing the amount of time between a pitch and the A&M batter getting back into the box, and there were several times it was going 25, 26 seconds between. That's on the umpire to get his abs- ass in the box. It's absolutely on the umpire. Come on. No, put in the pitcher and go. No, pitch. Let's go. Pitch. Yeah, um, and then it's, it's up to the pitcher to go, okay, okay. Here, here, I, here it is. And that's what got but that's, skirmish going the other day. But baseball <laughs> etiquette and stuff doesn't support that. Yeah. Uh, John Gaddis is out two more games, so he is not available for Ole Miss today, uh, tom- tomorrow, or hypothetically Wednesday. If Ole Miss loses tomorrow and gets into the NCAA tournament, he would also be out for the first game of a regional um, in that. So that was the, the the problem with what happened the other day. Is Frankly, Ole Miss doesn't have a lot of left-handers, so uh, Gaddis is important in that way. Although there was several times with A and M's pretty strong left handed lineup to go to Kimbrell on Saturday and just that, that was that, that was not an option that Mike uh, had gone to. You know, I talked to different people and I mean we know the score. We know that Mike's tenure is is what it is at the moment. And I've had some media members, had some fans. Saturday had a weird feel to it. Saturday had a watching a guy's last game feel to it, um, in a way that you know, look no no decision has been announced yet, but um, there was like a nostalgia with people. They were kind of going, you know, he's been here a long time. It's whatever. They were kind of like, everybody, was, everybody seemed to be almost like taking it in, almost like a senior takes it in on his last game a little bit. It was, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know that I necessarily felt it. There was a couple times where I went, yeah, this is probably, this could be this, this, this is whatever. I mean, it's been, for me, it's been 17 years. Um, but, it was the, and maybe it was something I was projecting, but I don't think so because, like I said, I've heard it from a lot of different people kind of having the same thought. There seemed to be almost a different energy around the place where it was a sentimentality on Saturday. As mad as everybody was and as mad as that fourth inning, and it was a little bit of, oh, see, that's one way to finish and you know, all the snarky stuff. But I don't know. The, the, the game Saturday had, it had a lot of good energy early, and then it went dead after those two home runs by a m there in the fourth. It was a long game. It was a long weekend, but people kind of took it that extra second a little bit, knowing that that was uh, potentially the end for Mike on Saturday, as far as games at Swayze Field. Because I had, well, I mean, I had Richard Cross ask me on Saturday night. I was like, "How many games do you think you covered for in person for Mike?" And I was like, "I was like, I, I came up with somewhere around seven hundred. Was probably what I thought somewhere in there." Uh, because he thought he was closer to 900 or 1,000 because he did radio for three years every single game. But, yeah, I don't know. I It wasn't to the point of people were, like, grabbing dirt or anything. I mean, I don't think it's that. But it was, uh, it was, a, it was a different feel. It was, it was something more than just last game. It was something more than just a game that Ole Miss needed they didn't get. It, it, had, a, it had a fun finality in the air, in a way. On was Saturday. he any different? I did not notice anything from that standpoint. He was not in a very good mood. Now, he wasn't. The Mike of five or eight years ago, if he was in the mood, I think he was in, would have been a little antagonistic from a, not yelling at anybody, but, you know, kind of snarky in a more aggressive way. I thought he was kind of passive. Um, he made some remarks that if you read the transcript, like he told, I think it was Michael Katz, like, was like basically told him it was a bad question that he asked. And it was... And, <laughs> Look, he wasn't wrong, and that's not at Cats. It's this thing that media and coaches do, and it's a dance a little bit where I just need a quote. I know the answer. You know that I know the answer, but I just need you to say it. And Mike's never been great at just saying it. Um, a lot of times he tries to think through angles and things to answers of questions, and it was a lot of questions about, you know, do you like where you're at headed into the postseason? Do you think you're a postseason team? Do you think you're playing your best baseball right now? A lot of those just – random soundbite things that get asked at the end of a year. And Mike's actual answers were honest. He goes, well, sure, but two things. A, what coach has ever said, no, their team's not an NCAA tournament team. And B, it doesn't really matter what I think or you think. It matters what 10 people in Indianapolis think. Which is a completely accurate answer, while at the same time he knows we just need the freaking quote. 
where he goes, yeah, we love blah 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 resume blah 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 blah. So it's 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 this dance because in know, some I ways I kind of go, I get it, kind of siding with Mike here. And again, he's coming. He's five minutes after a crap game. He's not in a great mood. I mean, it's. it's I mean, it's, you know his resume. Write it. Yeah. He didn't have to tell you his resume. You know who they beat, who they didn't beat. I'm kind of with him the more that I hear about it and think about it. And then it almost kind of became a game. Like, it was a couple times where I'm like, okay, can we just get out of here? Because we're not, like, we've, we've covered everything. Like, I've asked about Diamond, I've asked about McDaniel, we've asked whatever. Like, let's move on with the day a little bit. Someone could have said, do you think today was your last game to coach at Swayze? That would have been fun. Thanks. I'm good. Well, again, Mike's credit. It's not my decision. I don't know. I'm just coaching until I'm told I'm not coaching anymore. Okay. It's like, like Andy. I mean, it's what you know. It wasn't Andy's call. I mean, like I don't know. Like ask Keith. I mean, like I don't. You know, what, what do you want to do? Um. It it was a weird press conference. It was it was it was a really really strange press conference because like he was just. He was ready to go, and the questions wouldn't stop, and they were all kind of weird. So it just went on. It was like a nine-minute conference. Oh, God. Oh, no, no. It was on and on and on and on and on. Because we went to walk off, and then one of the media members goes, Hey, Mike, let me just ask you something off the record for a minute. I'm like, oh, God. Let me just let this man get off his field right now. Like, Because it was like, hey, do you think this start by Casey last year was the best? I was like, well, what are we doing right now? Like, why are we asking that? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm losing my mind a little bit. Uh because I looked at it, and I'm like, I know you're not announcing today, but I'm assuming after 50-something pitches, Delusia is available on Tuesday. And, like, it again, it's me going, I just need you to say it. Obviously, we all know Delusia's throwing, but you're obviously not going to announce that right now. And he just kind of looked over and grinned and goes, that's a good assumption. Fair enough. Like, again, yeah. you know what, what, we're just playing a game at this point. That is what we're doing right but now. But there are people in our field who don't understand the game. They truly yeah, don't. Sure. They, they don't get it. In football, they keep asking questions. It's almost like, hey, this needs to last longer. I'm going to ask Lane a personnel question, even though I know that he's not going to answer the personnel question. A long, rambling question makes me more uncomfortable than a snarky answer. Yes. I get anxiety as questions are being uttered, where I'm almost like, oh. Uh, you know the one that I hate? It's It's... It's it's something where, you know, Lane, you came here from FAU. He's like, really? <laughs> I did? <laughs> you know, Lane, you were once the offensive coordinator at Alabama. I was? I mean, did, why do you feel compelled to say that? The version on that on Saturday was, um, and we were deep into the interview at this point, and so he goes, you know, Mike, I mean, I, I know today notwithstanding, you swept Missouri and you swept LSU. And oh, you, you you got one in Hattiesburg, and, you know, you got the Governor's Cup, whatever state. And I'm like, okay, he's aware of the resume. Just what is the what he, is the, He what? was at all of those games. <laughs> Except one. Um, yeah, like, but he saw it. Yeah, I was like, what, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? You know? Um, so it was fine. I mean, he – I think Mike – here's the truth. I think Mike is aware of social media and is aware of video cameras. So his snark now versus 10 years ago is completely different. He's not going to undress somebody. You can tell I don't read anybody else's stuff. Are, are people ago. standing there holding cameras every time? Um, There's typically a camera on him, yes. Not always, but yeah. There's Ole Miss does not take a camera. No, 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 no. It's, so just, it's, it's media. just media holding phones or whatever up. But yeah, there is typically... Typically that, but I've there is definitely a change once that became more prominent versus just recorders and it was a little bit of a war zone after most games. Um, it is not the not the case anymore. And look, here's the deal too, and it's just the reality of frankly journalism. Mike's not going to yell at anybody he doesn't know. He's not even really going to get snarky with anybody he doesn't know. And it's been a carousel in a lot of ways. I mean. Nick Suss is the second longest tenured beat writer on the Ole Miss baseball beat right Is that now. right? And Suss has been there three years, maybe four. Yeah, something like that. 18 or 19 was long? his first year. He was in Fayetteville with me in 19, so I'm assuming 18 was his first year. Oh, wow. Year. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's some of it, too, is – I mean, I'm not going to embarrass the guy, but like, I mean, there was one guy that covers the team a lot that Mike asked me what his name was, like in mid-April. Um, 
Yeah. And it's just the difference, too. Of, you know, we always talked about baseball used to be so accessible. We don't have a lot of midweek interview sessions anymore. We don't do a lot of that. So it's changed. The dynamic of just kind of hanging out and talking to people. It, you, you've lost some of the human element. That's across the board in college sports. Yeah, that's everything. That's not. Um, it's 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 why so many of the young people that are getting in, they quickly figure it out, and they desperately try to get a professional beat. To get that type of. Well, it, it's, it's, and it's not about access. It's about being able to develop relationships to the point where you can tell stories. That's gone now. Certainly at the college level. I mean, just almost, it's just almost impossible. The uh, Ferris Award is today at like 11 or 11.30 in Jackson. Ole Miss is uh, headed where at least Mike Bianco and Tim Oko are headed down there for that, and they will head to Hoover for the practice that's uh, 3.20 today, something like that. And uh, in Hoover, the finalists for the Ferris Award, which is the top uh, amateur player in Mississippi, are uh, State's R.J. Yeager, Ole Miss's Tim Elko, Southern Miss's Tanner Hall, Delta State's Harrison Haley, and Bell Haven's Brett Sanchez. Those are your five finalists. Oh, Sanchez. Those are your five. He's a star. Who's mm-hmm. going to win it? Is the kid at Southern Miss really good? I would assume Elko or the Southern Miss kid wins it. Yeah, either one. Are you surprised it's Elko and not, Gonz- and not Gonzalez? I mean, Jacob's the better player. Jacob's the better player. Jacob's been hot as hell lately. I mean, it, frankly, I saw this on the board. I haven't done the math. His BABIP is like 243 this year. Batting average for balls in play. For and it's who, low. It means he's unlucky. Sorry, right. yeah, for people. that if, that if that's under 300, that means he's unlucky. And yeah, that's going to fly over some head. Sorry. Um, yeah, you last year it was like 360, which is probably on, in college about right. That's probably borderline average. So, point being, I wouldn't hold Jacob Gonzalez's uh, lower batting average this season against him. If he hits like three eighty nine next year, you'll go, no, he's the same player. It's just the way small sample size has sure. worked out over time. He's he's a stud. No, he's the better player. And he's defensively, he's been really good in league play. He kind of fixed some of the early stuff. Frankly, I think he just doesn't field well in cold weather. I think the temperature came up and he plays better defense. So, he's the better player, but... I think Elko got a little bit of a lifetime achievement award award, today, okay. which is I, fine. I yeah, mean, sure. I have I have no issue with that. I don't think Gonzalez is. Good. God damn it! Like, no, I don't. I'm, I'm, I don't, you know, I don't think the guy from California is going. You know, I really grew up wanting the Ferris Award. <laughs> you think Gonzalez, if you put a gun to his head right now and no one could help him, could tell you the name of the award or who Boo Ferris was? Oh, I know he couldn't tell you that. <laughs> do, you, do you think he could tell you the name? of They the said, award? "Hey, that thing Elko is going to today that luncheon." What is that award? What is it about? Do you think he could tell you? You don't think he can tell you what it's what it is? My guess is that he would have no idea. Even if he didn't know the name, you don't think he knows that's the best player in the state? My guess is no. Okay. And that's not a knock on him, by the way. It's just I I don't I don't think he would think about it. Well, yeah, whatever. I mean, it's not something that gets in your in your psyche from that point. Do they play tight tomorrow? They typically don't in Hoover. No, they typically typically don't. These are they, actually two teams that typically don't play tight in Hoover and typically do well in Hoover. Vanderbilt's name across their chest is more scary than their actual team right now. Mm-hmm. But that was not the draw. I mean, out of the options, you would much rather have played a leaking oil Georgia team that doesn't have much pitching and threw cannon on, like, Saturday. Oh, than sure. you would this. Sure. This was... This was the worst draw out of the possible draws for Ole Miss in a must-win Tuesday game because Vanderbilt can just out-talent you one day if they decide to play ball. Yeah. And they are – the middle of that order is kind of scary. I mean, Bradfield and the Jones kids had a good year. And Jones, they, they had, the Jones kids yeah. is the one I was telling you about. He's yeah. a stud. I mean, they've got some stuff there that's that's, that, that's pretty good. So, it's – That it's, kid looks like a major league player. It's still a tall task. Let's not, let's not mistake that. Even though this is not the the normal Vanderbilt that you're used to seeing, I mean they're they're going to, like Neil said, I think he's right. They're going to be a two seed somewhere, and I mean they very well can make a run, but I they have been to, inconsistent. I wouldn't want them to be the two seed in my regional. No, because it's up to them. That's the problem. Is it's really not up to you. If they play to their capability, they're going to beat you. Yeah, because they have more talent than you. Yeah, you're you're just hoping they stay in the shell of whatever it is that they. Yeah. I guess Corbin railed him on Saturday. I guess he yelled and screamed and probably. 
He's probably frustrated. He's he probably, doesn't seem like a kind, kind, gentle soul after losses. It's the equivalent of a Calipari team that there's they just never can get it together. And yeah, yet they and we've seen that. Look like a gazillion dollars in warmups. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. We'll move some football in a uh, in a second. We'll tell you about Northeast Spark and the SPARC service people across rural communities. Two packages: the Ignite, the 100 Mbps, or the Blaze, the one gig that powers the Clark Ford Studio. Your hometown team bringing you world class broadband. That's NESpark dot com six six two two three eight three one five nine. Phone service, parental controls, network security, and more. So contact their office for details and get them again the best internet in Lafayette County. That's six six two two three eight three one five nine. We're brought to you by Comer Heating and Air, Southern Air Conditioning and Heating, different names, same great products, same great services. If you live in Oxford, Tupelo, or the surrounding area, call Comer, 662-801-1777. If you live in Hernando, Memphis, or the surrounding area, call Southern, 662-429-4429. College Corner is your one-stop rebel shop, two locations in the Jackson area. In Ridgeland, it's next to uh, Fleet Feet. In Flowood, it's next to Half Shell. If you don't live in Jackson, it's okay. Uh, go to collegecornerstore.com. Plus, you can find them on Facebook and Instagram. Largest selection of Rebel gear in central Mississippi. Oh, we're brought to you by Pinnacle. Uh, Pinnacle's based in Madison, Mississippi. They've got clients in more than 20 states, advisors in multiple states as well. They provide detailed, specialized investment management, financial planning, retirement planning for individuals and businesses, and so much more. At Pinnacle, investing is treated like a commodity, and decisions are made Using objective information and research, not emotions. It's mypinwealth.com, M Y P I N N wealth.com. John Edwards of Regency Travel Incorporated in Memphis is the guy to go to if you uh, need to create a special trip that creates a lifetime of unique memories. Just get in touch with him, give him some parameters, give him a budget for your vacation, and he will come up with options that you will not come up with on your own. And no, you don't have to live in or near Memphis to take advantage of his services. 901-494-3387 or jedwardsregencytravel.net. Brought to you by OPA, uh, Oxford's newest restaurant on the square. Euros, wraps, kebabs, redfish, lamb chops, handcrafted cocktails, frozen libations, an amazing candlelit patio and more, all at 306 South Lamar, just south of the square courthouse in Oxford. And we're brought to you by Grenada Nissan. If you're in the market for a Nissan vehicle, Grenada Nissan's the place to go. They've got a complete selection of new and previously owned Nissan vehicles. Great lease deals as well. It's GrenadaNissanUSA.com. I'll have a mailbag up on Wednesday at some point. It'll be brought to you by Whitney McNutt of Tommy Morgan Incorporated Realtors, serving you for all of your real estate needs in Oxford and Tupelo. She sells condos, land, commercial, and residential family homes, and you can reach her at 662-567-2573 or 662-842-3844. Like I said, it's brought to you by G&M Pharmacy, 662-236-2222. They're on South Lamar in Oxford or on the square in Holly Springs with Tyson Drugs. They can switch over your uh, services from a big box pharmacy. All you do is give them a call. They handle the rest. Literally one call. You have what you need with your local community pharmacy there with G&M or Tyson Drugs. Again, 662-236-2222. They deliver locally in the Oxford area, and they offer MedSync. Free prescriptions the same day each month and take care of you. One trip to the pharmacy, one delivery. Have what you need when you need it with G&M. So, again, one more time, 662-236-2222. Uh, you understood, if nothing else, why uh, Greg Sankey put a gag order on his football coaches last week and amidst all the chaos. Sure. Yeah. Um. Lane Kiffin was going to go on Dan Patrick. Dan Patrick was going to ask him questions about Saban and Fisher. And Lane was probably going to be funny and throw out jabs. Those jabs. Sarcasm, if nothing else. Yeah. Sarcasm, sure. Yeah. Those were going to be, because media love to aggregate Lane Kiffin, those were going to create headlines. And if Lane said just one thing that could be misinterpreted, it could have gotten it going again. I don't think, based on what I've heard, that Sankey had any idea that Jimbo Fisher was going to go scorched earth. You think he would have stopped it pre that had he known that? I do. I think he was frustrated with Saban. 
I think he thought Jimbo was just going to defend himself. That's what he did last time, and sort of. And Jimbo, he was at least careful last time. He was angry last time, but he was careful. Not careful. He didn't really call out Lane specifically the last time. This time he went scorched earth on Nick Saban and created a lot of angst. I mean, you had Lane Kiffin, Eli Drinkwitz. I'm thinking of people I know for sure did it. Steve Spurrier, Hunter Juracek, all do some semblance of the popcorn thing. That's true. None of those tweets made Greg Sankey happy, I'm guessing. And it is his job right now to not let this thing dissolve into – because here's 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 why you – The bad PR, though, is let you let the two people have at it and then got mad at everybody else for rubbernecking. But I don't think he got mad. I think he was like, hey, let's cool this. Well, yeah, sure. But I guess cool my point is down. that's where the consequence came in. Yeah, but – it's more complicated than that. I know. I'm, I'm I'm not taking his side here because I'm in the media. I want everyone to go after everyone. <laughs> sure. But if I'm in his shoes, what I don't want is this. Lane gets on the Dan Patrick show, which everyone listens to. This isn't Lane going on our show or something. No, this one was getting. It's going to get. And get, at that time slot, right after that, I mean, we're in. Like, gonna let's get, keep this gonna get train views, rolling. Going to get views. Going to get listens. Media is going to be on it. It's going to get aggregated. Sure. Lane says something that is incendiary. Whatever that looks like. And then someone like Jimbo at this point, who's just thoroughly pissed, goes, all right, you know what? Let me tell you about the kid that they recruited. Because here's what they gave X. Wasn't NIL, what they gave him. And then someone goes, all right, that's it. Let me tell you what you did. And then now, you know what you have? You have the Southwest Southwest Conference. Conference. And that's what Sankey's job is to prevent. So I think if, and again, I'm not defending Greg Sankey, but I'm sure what he's trying to do is to get everybody to Destin so that he can close the door (laughs) and he can say, so let's talk about this. We're the most powerful league in the country. You guys are about to enjoy massive payments. Frankly, everyone wants to join our league right now. We control this bitch. Now, can we be big boys, or are we going to blow it up ourselves? Because if you hand them the ammunition, they're going to come get somebody. So how do y'all want to do this? And then I think it's going to be like that SEC shorts thing where he looks at Jimbo and he looks at Nick and he's like, kiss and make up, damn it. Not another word. Yeah, you can hate each other. But publicly, we're not doing this. This is not what we're going to do. There's too much at stake. And I think what he would probably say to Lane is, look, even I laughed at what you said, but we've got to present a corporate front. We, we, this thing can blow up, and we don't need it to blow up right now. There's a lot of money on the line. So, frankly, I don't blame him. It was from a corporate communication thing. If you're hand raised guy in the back of the room, you're probably at the SEC office. You're probably like, "Hey, we don't need we don't need coaches on radio shows right now." I did love the conference giving out as as Papa V says the the numbers in the code of what they were breaking to get yeah. their their reprimand. Yeah, ten two three and ten five two related to the ethical com- conduct inside the institution. Yeah. Okay. But what's he going to do? I mean, if he if he's going to have any teeth, it's you're both suspended from uh, your first conference hey, game. On. He's not going to do that. Yeah, not that important yet. yet. Now he might tell him in, in Destin, "I'm not. We're not doing this shit anymore." Jimbo, 100 percent that pissed and that real, or playing a character to some extent. Uh, I, I'm told. He thought he was that pissed. I'm told from people who know him that he was genuinely that pissed. Was he really? Yeah. Because, see, I thought the other one on signing day was a little bit of a pandering thing. I thought so, too. This one was, this one was, I'm pissed off. I'm calling a press conference and no one can stop me. I want to send like 12 minutes. And then I think it was. I'm, I mean, unless they were given a tip, the media barely, I mean, wouldn't have even time, time to get in there. Here's how I think. I don't think anybody there, had they known he was going to say that, would have let him go say that. I think they would have been like, hey, coach. Even the school? Yeah. Coach. 
Because it made for quite the video clips in front of the A&M logo behind him. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think they would have been like, hey, coach, defend the program, but take a minute. I mean, instead he was like, oh, there's the fire. Here's the gasoline. <laughs> Thinks he's God and the czar of college football. Yeah, I don't think anybody saw that coming. That was pretty a tad pointed. And so I think after that happened and it became the national story, everybody hit it. I think Sankey said we needed to hit a timeout. Just get us to Destin, for the love of God. Well, get I mean, to just, next week. We're, yeah, everybody shut up for a little bit. They get they arrive on Sunday or Monday, by the way, to people in Destin. That is next week. Yeah. You get Hoover this week and you get Destin next week. That is their next two weeks. I'm gonna tell you there's a cold front coming to Destin. If you're planning to be out on the beach, you feel some cold air. It came out of Texas. Icy. You don't think it's gonna be a big pool party at the San Destin like usual when they all uh, hanging they, out and having I, the big big some. I'd be curious to see what the, how the seating arrangement is made. I would like to know a seating arrangement. Uh, I'll be honest. I would like to know the room and the and the, the way this thing. Sets that's up. going to be my objective is to try to find out hey who who got put where, who was sitting next to who. Something tells me there's going to be some buffers. It's going to be like... Uh, Mark Stoops right there yeah. next to Saban. That sounds yeah. good. All right, we're going to put Mark here. Let's Shane Beamer. You yeah. don't cause any problems. Let's put the guys that never cause any problems. It just sort of... Uh, Sam, come sit right here. Yeah. Clark. <laughs> hey, Clark. <laughs> Buddy. You're good for something this time. It's all good. <laughs> oh. it- Lane's the type to walk in passing out popcorn. Uh, who knows? Yeah. Uh, who knows what this looks like? It does make media day at least compelling because it's not going to be over by then from a front of mind standpoint. No, oh no, no. Well, I mean, we talked about this. It works out perfectly for the, for the media days because you get Sankey on Monday and you get Kiffin on Monday. And Kiffin's going to get asked about it on that day and, if he takes the bait, and he usually does, he will create content that will get asked of Jimbo and Nick and whoever else. Anyone that's got a tie to Saban is going to get asked about it. And hell, that's half the league. Obviously, this is the most entertaining thing. But what, otherwise, from a business standpoint, what do you feel like Destin's about this year? Um. Well, NIL, the scholarship thing. Um, the scholarship thing is in. Is it real? What do we do with Title Nine? Can we afford it? What yeah. does it look like? Frankly, the the most interesting meetings, if you could just sit in on them, you think it's the football coaches, but it's not. It's it's the presidents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the presidents. presidents and ads are my far more interesting yeah. than this year. It's the presidents. Yeah, the really big picture stuff about what are we doing, like. Where's this headed? Is this headed to a place where they become employees and it's no longer a part of the educational model and you basically just lease your name? And they're just a team of essentially professional players that wear college uniforms? Do they sign contracts? Almost like a sponsored something. Yeah. Is that where this is? I mean, I don't mean like in the next three or four years, but is that where this is headed? Or is this going to reverse course and go back closer to what it once was. I don't really think that's possible, but I kind of wonder. That would be the meet. If I could just sit in a room and listen to a meeting, that would be the one I'd want to listen to. I mean, it'd be full of bluster and my God, but that's what I'd like to hear. I'd be curious. What what do you think? Where's this going? Is your gut that scholarships at the other sports are removed by this time next year? What do you mean? Scholarship limits? Yes, correct. Oh, um, I don't know. That's the They're other... removing them from football for two years, but that's not an across-the-board move yeah. to this point. I don't know. I kind of doubt it. 
I mean, there's so many complications. There's with so it. much to that where someone's got to sit down and go, are we creating financial issues for ourselves here? And this football thing is going to be raw chaos. But not signing more, sign as many as you want as long as you don't go over the 85. Yeah, you have 85. I mean, it, it's going to mean the, the number of kids basically getting processed. Because yeah, if there's a better player, you just cut and add. Yeah, you can't help us buy. Because there's no penalty anymore no. for going over or under your number. And apparently they've, the APR issue is not really something to worry about. Yeah, that's what I wasn't sure about, those hidden things. I mean, apparently, if you're just kind of on pa- roughly on pace to graduate, it doesn't hurt you. Are we set now pretty much? Did You believe pretty wholeheartedly it's 2024 before we get Texas and Oklahoma? Yeah, I don't think they're coming in 2023 at this point. It'd be hard. So, I mean, there's some people think it's going to be 2025, but they're just going to ride it out. And that, we're going to have a Big 12 with all the new teams and the old teams. Yeah, that last year in the Big 12 will be miserable for everyone involved. Texas gritting its teeth because, frankly, Oklahoma can't afford the grant rights out in a yeah, way. Well, you're telling Texas, And hey, Texas goes, hey, home game, Central Florida. Yeah, Big or, 12 or worse, conference. you have to go play there. Yeah. Hey, you get Cincinnati at home, you get to go to UCF. Who else is coming in? It's BYU and Houston. Oh, yeah. Oh, that would be the worst for Texas. Hey, you got to go play at Houston. That's a slap in the face. In a conference game. Yeah. They let them chant Big 12 at you and when they beat you. Right. That would suck. But they lost to Kansas. It can't get worse. Well, that's true. You surprised Kansas didn't try to find a home? Uh, they did try to find a home. As hard as they could have? Yeah. I mean, they Big did. 10 decided no go? Big 10 didn't want them. Pac-12 didn't want them. Apparently the SEC didn't want them. SEC, Surprise you? SEC may should have thought about it. They kind of need another SEC. bad team. Oh, and you get the basketball. Yeah, yeah, you get the basketball for sure. Another bad team doesn't hurt anything. Somebody's got to suck. Vanderbilt serves a purpose in this league. Of course. Right now, of the 14 programs, Vanderbilt's the only one that sucks. I mean, Clark Lee, look, he's not getting the headlines, but he, he's got a purpose right now. It's the, I mean, but to look at the rest of it, pick another team and go, they suck. The closest thing is Missouri, and they went to a bowl last year. Yeah, they try. Other than that, I mean, like. They signed like the number one wide receiver in the country. That's what I'm saying. I mean, look at the rest of the league and tell me who sucks. Good luck. The answer is nobody. It's a tough league. You know who's one, and you know who's two, and you know who's 14. Three through 13 is kind of up for grabs. Certainly some teams are better positioned than others, but you could could have arguments about, you know, who do you put in front? Tennessee, Kentucky, Ole Miss, LSU. Where does Auburn stand? I mean, Mm -hmm. there's a lot there. Yeah, you could have used you could have used another crappy team in football. Because they're not going to get substantially better. I do think Leopold's a good coach. Yeah, he's good. They, it's, apparently, it's a very difficult place to get it done. Well, yeah, no. but I'm sure they I'm sure they would have loved to have joined the SEC. Well, anywhere because there's stability. Yeah, in that. and they're they would help the basketball product. Yeah, like somebody said they should become Villanova. No, you're still making your money in football. You need the paychecks from the major conference in football, yeah. no matter what it looks like. Yeah, you need the TV checks. Yeah. Yeah. There's no benefit to going down. No. I mean, you're hurt all the way across the board. That's that's nothing but negatives in, in a lot of ways at that point if you if you do that. So no, you don't. You don't do that. North Carolina has always been the really intriguing one if you got to just pick and choose. And well, North Carolina is the one the SEC wants. Yeah. If you could just really go grab whomever. That's who they want. That's and the one that makes sense. That's the top of the line. North Carolina makes a ton of sense in the SEC if it ever happened. It makes so much sense in the same way that Texas and Oklahoma do. Your basketball product, it's got built-in rivalries right off the bat with South Carolina, with Tennessee. 
I mean, it makes just it makes so much sense that it's almost certainly going to happen down the road. I don't know you when. Think so. I think so. I mean, I'm, I'm on is record. What, I, is what Sankey said a clue, or is it just whenever that time is, we will go to 16 and remove divisions? Uh, just whenever that time is. There's no rush. No. I mean, there will be seasons played at four at, at fourteen. At sixteen, you mean? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe. I mean, who knows what happens with the the, the Pac-12 grant of rights and their TV contract ends at the same time. I mean, the, frankly, it's bad lawyering. I mean, yeah, because you're allowing too many exits. They're, they're free agents. There. They're, they're, there's no punishment. They're they're free to go. Grind asking, is the SEC willing to buy out an ACC team from their grant of rights? It doesn't expire until 2036. Yeah, it would not be the SEC doing it. it would be would, would Disney be willing to do it? Would that make enough on the contract? Would those teams? Because, I mean, the SEC is not telling Oklahoma, yeah, we'll go ahead and help you right now and get no. you in quicker. No. They're making Oklahoma pay that check on whatever that is. It's like yeah. 70-something million. Yeah, it goes down each year, but it's like 70-something. Apparently, Oklahoma feels like it just doesn't have it. We need to get – I'll get Murdoch back on sometime soon. Talk about what's going on. Are you going out to Oklahoma City to cover softball next week? See. Probably. Really? I mean, it's close, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's 20 minutes. I didn't really think hey, – never mind. Bad example. I saw Kubelik tweeting about it for some reason last night. Their softball team is 52-2 and two on the season. Oklahoma's? Yeah. Yeah. And they've, they've outscored people like 550 to 130 or something. I mean, it's 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 insane. They have three pitchers with ERAs under one. So they're the favorite. Um, Ole Miss's softball season ending uh, in L.A. yesterday. UCLA beating them in the regional final out uh, out there. I don't know who UCLA plays now, but um, the Rebels lost to Loyola Marymount, came back, beat Grand Canyon, beat Loyola Marymount, and then lost to UCLA. So that was the uh, the path there for the uh, I guess the two seed Rebels in uh, in that one. So anyway. Podcast brought to you in part by Prime Shrimp, primeshrimp.com. Ready to uh, eat shrimp delivered straight to your door, restaurant-quality shrimp that you just uh, throw in a pot of boiling water. It's ready in just a few minutes, less than 10 minutes from freezer to plate. It's got five different flavors, including Simply Shrimp, the garlic herb butter, their two newest. You take the garlic herb butter, put it with pasta, veggies, rice, or makes a shrimp scampi or paired with a ribeye, if you so wish for that. With the Simply Shrimp, doctor it up any way you like. It's a great option for kids if you need to put certain flavors on it for them. So, again, throw it in. Great for lunch, great for dinner, and more. Use code MPW, $20 off your first order with Prime Shrimp, primeshrimp.com. We're also brought to you by Service Specialist Staffing and Recruiting Agency. They've been connecting great job opportunities to candidates since 1967. If you're on the job hunt, whether you're seeking an entry-level position or you're a seasoned professional, they have opportunities across the board uh, in all sorts of fields, IT, engineering, dentistry, whatever. They've got it. It's always free for the candidate. All conversations are kept confidential, so you have nothing to lose by giving them a call. Give uh, Wit, Will, Sydney, or Kelsey a call at 662-832-5138 or check out their new and improved website, servicespecialistltd.com. We're also brought to you by The Rogue. It's your destination for fine men's clothing. Their stylist hand-select pieces from top designers from work to lifestyle to nightlife. There's the perfect something for everyone at The Rogue. All the best items from Peter Millar, Martin Dingman, Jack Victor, Halsey, True Grit, Duckhead, and more. 4450 I-55 North in Jackson or therogue.com. Don't just accept what you see, but imagine something new. Step forward, chase after a better version of yourself. Every day, Corinth Dental is helping people reinvent themselves one smile at a time. Dr. Bubba McQueen, Dr. Jenny Beth Hendrick are devoted to restoring and enhancing the natural beauty of your smile using conservative state-of-the-art procedures, including Invisalign. Uh, these clear aligners are the virtually invisible way to improve your smile. Call Corinth Dental today for a no-cost digital scan of your teeth. Let them show you the way to a straighter, healthier smile. 12 months, no interest, no down payment. Financing available at CorinthDental.com. Uh, we're brought to you by Bell & Grove. Based out of Chattanooga, Daryl Oliver and Evan Dial built Bell & Grove, a logistics provider with more than 35 years of transportation industry experience. They specialize in domestic freight movement throughout the continental U.S. that can navigate through supply chain issues while also leaning on their partner carriers to get the most competitive rates possible for their customers. 
In addition, Bell & Grove can help customers design a custom solution for their shipping needs. Whether your business is in need of moving a truckload, a partial shipment, or a flatbed, Bell & Grove can accommodate you. They also provide both air and ground expedited services for customers who need to move product quickly. For more information, call Daryl Oliver at 865 672 6557. A Southern Traditions Farm is a 68 acre, 32 stall upscale equestrian training and boarding facility in Canton, Mississippi. Two sand rings, a grass ring, miles of wooded trails. There's a lot going on at Southern Traditions, including camp season, which begins in a week. Uh, it's Monday through Friday camps, 8.30 to 2. Great uh, opportunity for young people this summer. So uh, get in touch with the, those guys on Facebook or Instagram at Southern Traditions Farm. So people are asking, yeah, it's a bit of a mess. So uh, weather for Alabama this week. Today it's raining right now. They had a big storm come through this morning in Hoover. Um, kind of stops around noon, it looks like. And then tomorrow, 56% chance of rain tomorrow, partly to mostly cloudy with scattered showers and thunderstorms in the afternoon. That's lovely. And again, 60% chance. Then Wednesday, it goes up to 70. It's pretty much all day. It says early with thunderstorms developing later in the day. Thunderstorms overnight, Wednesday night. And on Thursday, 97% chance of thunderstorms uh, with winds 15 to 20. Chance of rain 100% with local heavy rainfall of inches. Have fun. Might not be there by Thursday. Um, look, they what? Let's make it was. What do they do? Well, they play all night. I mean, they delay and delay, and then find a window and play. It, it's miserable. It's it's just this. Yes. It's it, it's it's waiting. It's it's hide and seek with the weather. Is well, what the year is. that I was over there that you told me I wouldn't be there, but a day, and I was there till Sunday night. There were rain delays. Then after the championship. I wrote, and on my way to the car, got just bombarded in a storm. So, enjoy. I was there the one year they switched it to single elimination after a couple of days because they just got flogged to the point that they had to quit the double elimination part of the bracket and it just became single elimination from that point. That field, if I remember right, drains okay? No, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. not... It, it, that's not really the problem. It's just in that kind of forecast, there's no window to get right. four games in. It's right. not one game. You got to play four. You got to play all day. Well, and then Friday becomes the makeup day. So instead right. of playing two games on Friday, you play four games on right. Friday. Saturday, instead of two games, you play four games. Like, right. There are windows built into the schedule now because. And the rest of the week looks okay, right? Once you get past that Thursday. Yeah, Thursday's the last day. You're so. If you told me the Tuesday game happens Wednesday, oh god, I mean we're. This thing, yeah, it can get stupid a little bit. Um, it's the best thing they ever did was to make Saturday single elimination. Because they used to have that day with the four games on Saturday where you had to beat the other team, the team in your bracket twice. It's like, okay, all these teams are in the tournament. What are we doing? Why are we mm -hmm. playing all day long? Just play one game, go to Sunday, play one game, and call it a day. Because Ole Miss did that in 07 and 08 back-to-back. -back. They played two games on Saturday both those years. Um so there's there's makeup possibilities there, um, but no, it could it could get it could get hairy. I mean, I mean Neil can go if he wants. I haven't left yet. Um, he does get more wins in Hoover than I do by winning percentage. I do, but no, you have titles. I mean, it's what it is one of the crazier stats. There in the last seventeen years, I have covered the SEC tournament fifteen times, and the two years I haven't covered it, they have won the title. I have covered championship games, but they have won the title the two years that uh, that I have not participated. Yep. Georgia says it should be entirely single elimination. They are maxing out tourism revenue is one of the reasons. And yeah. frankly, coaches don't want it to be single elimination. Right, and TV. Yeah. You got to, you're filling windows here in a lot of different yeah. ways. But when Wednesday gets there, you're guaranteed fans stay for a couple of days. And then you get by the weekend and it's... Yeah, sure. It's... And then at some point, you kind of go, okay, we've had enough, and it, it is what it is. Well, then on Monday, they can take all the same TV cameras down to Destin, and they get programming down there. All those people come on set, and they interview them. And... Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, because like whatever teams are left on Saturday, typically all the ads and everybody's in Hoover because they're just on the way to Destin, so they come for the games and to be around. And yeah, then they'll yeah they'll move on. They'll head there. down to Destin on Sunday, Saturday. Some of them will head down Saturday. I know Sankey ended up doing it, but tweeting out or Ross tweeting out that. Alabama broke protocol uh, in the league. It's like, oh, stop. <laughs> are we really telling? Like, what are we doing? Like, Ross told a story, though. That, that Alabama was mean. <laughs> yes. It didn't come off well PR-wise. Yep. You know that thing where you just stay quiet until the other person starts talking. Yeah. I feel like that's probably a good time for me to just shut up. You were and stare you, at you. You're 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 baiting me, and I didn't take it. <laughs> I didn't bite. I was the fish, and I realized, you know what? That's not a real. You had you had a thought. It's not real. Oh, I've got thoughts. You mentioned Spurrier earlier. His uh, his comment was, "Did Saban actually say something that wasn't true?" The answer is asking the question. Well, kind of, he did. Well, not about other people, about himself, which is Nick yeah, and Mo. Yeah, um, the the stuff that, also the stuff that he said about the the or the origination of the transfer portal was wrong. It wasn't because, it wasn't because they kept getting sued. It was because there was a demand for it, and in the summer of peaceful protest, the NCAA just said, "Here, t- let's take it all." It was, it was a lot. There was a lot more to that part. The, the part that was disingenuous about Saban was that that those comments came literally at an event where he was there to drum up money for NIL. He didn't. He was rallying. People he was at that rallying point. his troops. He was doing what he always does, and this time he, for whatever reason, he got personal. I mean, in fairness to Jimbo, Nick started it. He got personal about he singled out A and M, and then he singled out Jackson State. Oh, so good. it showed you that those two things bothered him. Singling out Jackson State is interesting because Dion has nothing to lose. Yes, and I meant to clarify, mostly peaceful. Yeah, but you know what I mean. Like you go at Dion, and like what's Dion has no. I mean, some bonfires, but. You go at Dion, it was dumb. Like, did Dion ever circle back, or did Nick apologize too, too quickly? I thought he circled back to something, but it wasn't this. Just <laughs> he didn't throw a flamethrower at it the way I yeah. kind of thought it was coming. Yeah, it seemed like we were about to get. I thought I thought Sanders was going to really go after him because he seemed to set up you thought he was ready to go well i thought he was getting ready to basically accuse saban of being a racist mm-hmm. i thought that's what i mean i thought that was what he set up with his or with his tweet right i never saw that follow through no but dude you haven't seen you haven't seen jimbo apologize not a word he's not going to miss he can't pr wise I don't. He can't apologize. No, I, don't, I don't think he can. I don't think he wants to. I mean, I thought that was. I thought that was pro- the one misstep of the whole week is Saban actually apologizing. Just shut up, move on, don't say anything else. But I thought the apology was weird. Yeah. You can't say it and go, "Hey, look, I'm sorry." No, you're not. You're just getting told because whether you mean it or not, it just looks like Sankey told you to say I'm sorry and shut up, which I think is what happened. You think Sankey said you have to apologize? I think he at least said, "Hey, can we just move this over?" Yeah. Well, by that. But then when you apologize, it looks like you didn't mean it. I know. That's what I'm saying. That was the misstep in this. And you meant it. Yeah. And we're in semantics here. A&M bought their class. Of course A&M bought their class. A&M goes, well, we followed state law. Okay. Okay. But you used NIL as an incentive. Yeah, which doesn't follow NCAA law. And we're, Nick says we don't, which is bullshit. Yeah. Um. Somebody asked, I mean, we've talked about this 7,000 times, but somebody asked why Hoover, because it sets up perfectly for the elite office to be there already. Um, it has tons of RV space, tons of parking lots. It has plenty of restaurants around, and it is perfect for the person coming to the tournament. Yes, and it also 
is there's shit tons of media space that it, it works. Yes, and for the SEC, all of their personnel can continue to get ready for the meetings at home. At home. And they have a lot of their personnel that needs to be at the SEC tournament through about Friday. Mm-hmm. And then they get they need to get them down to Destin. And this is just easier yeah. than moving it to Memphis. And going the, and going and going. And number going. one is those minor league parks. The logistics are terrible. Well, they don't have any space for media. Because they have typically at a minor league game, there's like two media. Yeah, Pearl has three seats where a person can see the whole field. Yeah, so it doesn't work. And AutoZone's not much better. It's a little better, but not much. Hoover just makes sense. They should leave it there forever. Yeah, it's fine. We say that, too, because it's kind of close and easy. But, yeah. But it's fine. But it is close and easy to the schools that need it. I mean, Ole Miss, LSU, State, and Arkansas are the people who come to this stupid tournament. And people who bring RVs, there's RVs for them to stay. Yeah. It's fine. There's Mm -hmm. lots of parking. It's fine. It works. Yeah, I've never believed the bids were actually real over the years. No, I never even understood. I thought they had to contractually, but that, hey, Hoover, just send like a sheet of paper over. and Grind mentions Biloxi. It's the same thing. There's no place for, there's no place for media. There's not, those minor league parks aren't built that way. You'd have to play it. In a major league, and frankly, park. they don't want to put it in a spot like that where everybody's going down to one spot. Like it logistically, even travel that doesn't. I mean, we do live in the Reds media market. They could play it in Cincinnati, they Great could. American Ballpark. They could. They press box seating there because the ACC has kind of figured out. Hey, it's better in North Carolina than Boston. Yeah, where do they play theirs? Greensboro, North Carolina, or something, yeah. something like that. Greenville, yeah, I don't know, um, somewhere like that. So, um, schedule wise, we'll have a podcast to you. Tomorrow, um, I guess prior to the game, since it's 4.30, uh, we'll do something. And then uh, the rest of the week, it is so dependent on game times. You'll get your shows, but I don't know what it looks like or anything else. It really depends. Wins, losses, times, delays, when they're eliminated, when I'm driving. We'll, we'll figure it out. But as of right now, I don't have a lot of answers for uh, exactly what that looks like. Um, I'll get over there today. We'll have some coverage from, uh, from that. And again, they play, I hope to God, at 4.30 tomorrow. But... It could be five, it could be six, it could be noon on Wednesday, for all I know at this point. So, uh, hope you have a wonderful day. We will be back with some more shows. Check rebelgrove.com in the meantime, and we'll talk to you very soon.